Hey, what's up guys? Pete Moriarty here. I have with me today the amazing Barbara Turley from the Virtual Hub uh, and I'm going to be sharing a live interview. This is happening live uh, and uh, this is just our PeterMoriarty.tv live series chats with uh, close business owners of mine who I think are very relevant to chat to with the current economic situation and uh, super excited to have Barbara here. So if you're listening in live, please go ahead and drop your comments below. We'll be reading them. I'll be answering your questions uh, with Barbara. I'll, I'll be asking your questions to Barbara. And uh, uh, yeah, let's uh, get it kicked off. So Barbara, let's uh, bring you in. Thanks so much for coming along. Great to have you here. Thanks for having me, Pete. It's, it's exciting to finally have a chat with you. It's been a remote work. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's been a while. Uh, we've known each other since back, I think we bumped into each other maybe in the Entourage days uh, when I was doing some work with long those guys. Ago. Very long time ago and I've observed your business blossoming and uh, really happy about that and we've been able to do some work together which is awesome as well. I see tickets coming back and forward from our teams which is really cool. So uh, yeah, tell us, tell us about how you're going at the moment and, and how's the business? Yeah, sure. So I think the, 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 I mean, business, business is actually okay. It's, um, it's been an interesting five or six weeks. I don't know how far into this whole crisis we are right now. It's definitely, mm. I'm definitely tired as yeah. I'm sure many people are <laughs> Yep. in that, you know, I think the, the first sort of three, four weeks of this crisis for everyone has been that whole protect, you know, mm. try to sort of uh, shore up your operations, figure out what the hell we're doing next. Um, I mean, I have an office-based uh, operation. The Virtual Hub has yep. 140 staff. Wow. Um, 115 or so of those are in an office um, in Cebu in the Philippines. Mm. And we had to move 110 staff into a work-from-home situation when 35% of them had no computer and no internet at home. So that wow. has been very tiring. <laughs> Crazy. So, uh, I mean, a great lesson in leadership and in, mm. in crisis management. I mean, you know, I think we've all sort of gone through this period and now we're coming out the back of that. And I'm thinking um, there's been a lot of lessons in that, in, mm. in, in how to do that successfully. One of the reasons I think we were so successful with doing it is because I started off the business as a work from home model. And, mm. uh, you know, when I became a client of IT Genius, they, we, were, we were a work from home. So we were already kind of set up and knew how to do it. Uh, but still very, very challenging over the last few weeks and, and, and trying to get your head out of that and into like pivoting and creation mode and what are we doing next and do we sell? And I'm, I, I have found that quite challenging mentally. Uh, every day you get up to like, oh, I need to I need to find your fight like in this in this market. So that's where we're at, where I'm at today anyway. Mm. So um, I'm assuming you're active CEO in the business. Uh, how did you Sorry, go... Yeah. How did you go leading that, leading that change with your team? You've got 140 employees and you had to say, hey guys, like your whole paradigm is about to be changed. How did you go handling that? Yeah, so I think one of the big lessons I learned, uh, and I don't think I did this deliberately, I think it was just by accident that I did this right. Hmm. I resisted the emotional roller coaster that was coming. So hmm. for example, we were get, starting to get tickets from clients. Oh, my poor VA is scared and I don't see why my VA can't work from home. And, mm -hmm. and I had to push back on that because I was like, in the early days before we were in this situation, mm. I had to speak to some clients and to VAs. I had to say, we act as one team here. We, our mm. culture is very much one team. And I said, whatever decision we make right now is going to be across 110 staff and not one especially yeah. not one who worked part time for a client yeah. just because we have this fear mongering and we've got a situation that has not yet gotten to that point. So I learned very quickly that you need to have stages of response and to stay grounded in an emotional situation like that, where people are pushing back on you to stay grounded in your leadership. Uh, I found hard, but it definitely paid. It's it paid back in the end because I got everybody onto the same page. Yeah. And then when it came time to move, what I started doing was planning the move with my like my very high leadership team, despite staying grounded and resisting it on the floor. Mm. And then it, it gave us time to plan what we were actually going to do across that many people. Because if you allow one person to go working from home, then you've got a domino effect. And and we would have been we would have been killed with that because yeah. we did yet know at that stage that so many people didn't have computers and didn't have internet connection. 
So when we found that out, then I had to go to the clients and say, okay, now that we've stayed grounded and we have, you know, gotten our facts together, we have unearthed that we have this issue and mm. we are dealing with it. And I asked for the clients to support us in making the decision across the whole company and not just for, for their VA, because they were sort of mm. thinking about their own VA. Um, so yeah, that, that's been a major lesson and kind of, I definitely think that's something uh, others can learn from to try to stay grounded in, in, a, in a heightened situation like that and make the right decisions at the right time with the right planning. Mm. I think that's like, that's the, that's 101 for a CEO, isn't it? Like protection of the organization. Uh, yeah. And, um, you know, if you start making decisions based on one individual staff member or one individual customer, like that's the death of you. Uh, <laughs> yeah. and, uh, making the, having your employees and your clients understand that mm. and I actually got lovely emails back from clients mm. who said gee I had never thought about it from that perspective thank you so much for sharing yeah. that that is the challenge because otherwise I looked like you know this cold hearted CEO who wouldn't let the VAs <laughs> work from home you know I was like that's yeah. not actually the case so, um, so yeah the clients were just so supportive then when, mm. we, when we did move and you know we had to tell them that you know you're going to have internet challenges there are mm. going to be things that are outside of our control mm. there are going to be potentially data security issues mm. for some of our clients they weren't able to get past those security issues and we yep. then had to think about well if we have people staying in the office how do we do that safely yes, so we rented yeah. a bus we have our own private driver we have a bus we pick people up we cater in all their food and there's only about 10 people left in the office anyway mm. but we look after them very deeply and they're still at the office and, and they're working away there so yeah mm. it's just getting around the challenges i think uh so your email that you sent us being a customer of you as well um your email that you sent was one of the first emails that i received from a small business oh um, yes late. I oh we're too late no and you I you did. you know we're, we're a week before we sent anything out and it, it actually it really led how i approached uh that communication yeah. of the, our response to our customers um, so i appreciate that um, but I think what I appreciated in what you did communicate was um, that here's what we're doing, uh, and and we've and we've thought about it, and we have an action plan. Uh, there were plenty of our suppliers that we didn't hear a peep from, uh, and we were reaching out to them, kind of going, "Hey, is everything okay?" <laughs> uh, so yeah. to to you know receive that and um, to have it, you know, for us it was in a timely manner. Uh, that was just uh, you know that was awesome. Uh, so Thank you for I commend that. you for that. I think in this role as well, you don't hear enough. Like I got a few emails from clients and, and you know, people who are sort of friends and stuff. But it's good to hear that because I think in a time like this, you also don't know that you're making the right decisions and you mm. don't know how it's going to resonate. And I decided yeah. to go the completely raw approach. And I, yeah. you probably saw my videos. I was like, here's why I'm... I'm uncomfortable with going back to this work from home model that I started with. And I was mm. very raw and honest with clients about why that was mm. the case. Um, but I did it anyway, because it was the right thing to do for the people. Yes. Yeah, totally. I didn't see that video, but the, but the, I saw the, the emails and, uh, and the responses with that. Um, so I want to dig into a little bit about uh, the business and, and chatting with you. I've, I've actually had on my mind to, to call you and connect with you and, and chat about a few things. Uh, I want to chat about like the, you know, the kind of um, Philippines and the outsourcing and, and that journey. Uh, but I'm mostly interested in how you've transformed from, um, you know, a business that kind of started. You were previously based here in Australia. Um, and I know that the business is now domiciled uh, outside of Australia. You've recently moved to France with your family, which is awesome, uh, apart from being locked down and not being able to ski. <laughs> uh, so, you know, I'm interested because, you know, we're, we're a business that's going through growth and scale and we're starting to attract international customers and uh, we're starting to think about, okay, well, you know, is Australia the best place for us to be incorporated and, and all those kind of questions starting to come up. Um, what, what was your journey like there? I'm, I'm curious. Yeah, look, looking back, it's been, there were times it was so frustrating because I, I didn't have anyone to really talk to about these decisions uh, and yeah. I'm trying to find the right advisors. I mean, it, it's just, that's why I, like, I'm happy to share with anyone mm. the journey. Um, it started off, it was such, I call it my accidental business. I mean, honestly, <laughs> I, you know, I had biz, done business plans for other businesses before yep. and this one sort of started over my shoulder by accident and I turned around and was like, oh my God, there's a business right there. Mm. 
in that I was a business coach in Australia, um, yep. doing okay. You know, I, I wasn't that into it, to be honest. I think I was an all right coach, but I wasn't that into it. And I found I was enjoying more doing systems and processes with clients and getting VAs in to help them just so we could get on with strategy. And I had a VA in the Philippines and it just started out like a couple of her friends. And and before I knew it, I was getting more demand for VAs than I was for business coaching. And I was finding mm. I was enjoying talking about that more. Yep. Um, and then I literally was like overnight going, I think there's a business in this. I don't know why people would pay me to do it when you can just go online and get your own VA, but mm. people seem to struggle with this. Yeah. So the virtual hub was literally born very by accident, no website, no like, I mean, no business plan, nothing. And the first six months were hell, absolute mm. hell. Um, we did loads of sales, but I rapidly started to see why people needed help with outsourcing. Mm. Because it's not as simple as people think, as you know, like you can go to Upwork and get a VA. Yeah. <laughs> you might get a home run on your first try, um, but the majority of people have had like really bad experiences. Yeah. VA have even had very bad experiences with clients. Hips, so yeah. it, it's a combination of this whole like delegation gap, communication gap, um, inability to use online tools like Asana or G Suite mm, or Hangouts mm, or mm. just this, this inability to connect properly. Um, and then on the VA side, not trained properly. Like, you know, they've learned their skills through a, a sort of mishmash of projects on Upwork and they're not really deeply trained. Mm. So the business day fast forwarding five six years um obviously i've got a company in the philippines i decided to legitimize the whole thing a few years ago and actually mm. have employees and we can dig into why i did that but um it's a we, well we're about 125 staff at the moment yeah. uh off based temporarily i don't know what way it's going to look from here but um uh yeah we're domiciled uh in hong kong with a philippine uh structure as well and we have mm. clients all over the world so we operate mm. 24 hours um yeah but it, it 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 was a labor of love in that the first six months i i sort of after about eight months i nearly shut it down and i was like i can't do this anymore because wow. i was just getting slammed all day out by facebook messenger skype messenger email mm -hmm. anywhere a client could get to me they just wanted to, to complain about how bad the vas were and honestly yeah. some of those early VAs were terrible yeah <laughs> were terrible. yeah yeah so I did rebuild it after about six months. And then I spent about 18 months building a platform where we train clients, we train VAs, we, we nailed our recruitment process. I mean, we nailed it again two years ago. Um, and then you just start to build over time and you have to keep yep. iterating and, and, and move so, it. So, so how much of that training is uh, training uh, businesses how to work with remote teams and how much of it is like the, the, the Philippines culture, like this is how to work with a remote worker in the Philippines? Most of it's about how to use the systems and how to work with virtual mm. teams. So I cool. shameless for my podcast. I've told I have a podcast that I produced out of frustration initially <laughs> called the Virtual Success Show, where we actually talk about all the tactical things like, you know, how often should I talk to my VA? Like very, very tactical sort of stuff. Amazing. Awesome. Yeah, lots of shows on that kind of thing. Um and we train clients more on that. We should do more on culture. Mm -hmm. But to be honest, I, I, I think we actually recruit people who are able to deal with the Western culture as opposed to getting clients to try to cope with the Philippine culture so much. Yeah. It's a tricky one. You know, lots of our VAs are well capable of dealing with Western clients. So we're, yeah. we're you know, we don't find that such a big problem anymore. I guess you then like you, you start to get into the territory and we've had this challenge ourselves. You start to get into the territory of, uh, you know, like business advising and it's like, oh, you know, how far do I want to go down that road yeah. of telling, telling you how to run your business? Uh, like, you know, your culture is your responsibility um, in a way, uh, but also I guess, you know, your job is to really gear people up to be as prepared as possible to take this yeah. step in their, in their staffing. Yeah, I think one of the things I do around culture and communi like communication is a tricky one because, I mean, how many marriages have fallen apart because of bad communication? <laughs> yeah. It's, yeah. It, it, it's a problem in society in general. So mm. there's only something you can teach people about how to communicate more effectively. And yeah. I mean, I'm still a student of it myself, trying to do it better. Um, but we do teach clients certain things that we've learned. We're not mm. saying it's best practice. It's just like, I try to share my own experience of the mistakes I've made and what I've done to fix those mistakes, as yep. opposed to saying, here's the Bible according to Barbara Turley as to what <laughs> you should be doing. I'm like, well, I don't know if it'll work for you, but this is what works for me and for the yeah. whole company as a whole. Yeah. 
I'm just yeah. really happy sharing other people's ideas. I'm saying, I, I, I just love to say, hey, I got this idea from this person. You might like it. Got this idea from this person. You yeah. might like it. I'm, I'm just a whore for other people's ideas and I just, I just keep spreading the love. Yeah. <laughs> I just make all my own mistakes and then I come out and say, hey, this was excruciating for me. I, I'm hoping nobody else has to go through this. Don't do pain. this. <laughs> I'm willing to share. <laughs> yeah. Even with the structure and all the, you know, the entities and stuff, mm. desperately difficult situations. Yeah. Yeah. So um, happy to share all this. We've got heaps of people watching, which is great. Thanks so much for everyone who's joined us. Ian, Alastair, Neil, Michael, uh, Nadi, please, guys, uh, drop your questions below. Uh, if you'd like me to ask yeah. Barbara any particular questions, we're talking about outsourcing, we're talking about remote teams, uh, we're talking about the current economic situation. So uh, please let us know. Or if you just want to say hi, that'd be amazing uh, to let us know if you have any ahas uh, or anything that's interesting to you. Um, so. I've, I've always been of the opinion uh, that when hiring, uh, if you're going for your first few hires, you should absolutely do it through an agency. Uh, we obviously, we hire direct uh, and I want to help people uh, build effective teams and if it's more cost effective, then that's easier uh, and that's a good thing. But it's kind of like giving someone a loaded gun saying, hey, go to Upwork or go to online jobs and yeah, just use this job ad template and you'll find someone great. It's just not that simple. So I've always said, look, if you're hiring your first one to three international team members, go through an agency. Uh, what do people do when they then scale up? Um, do you find that people work with you for a number of years, kind of building out the initial team and then they uh, uh, go to like a more traditional BPO type business um, or do businesses, you know, end up growing with you and staying with you over a long period of time? What does that look like for you? Funnily enough, they end up staying with us and growing with us over a long mm. period of time. I'll cool. tell you why. You start to get, you know, when you get teams that are growing to sort of five, now we don't have loads of these, I'd like more, but, you know, that yep. are growing to five or six people. We obviously, like one of the things that we do very well at the virtual hub, I mean, I've invested a lot of money in this, is we mm. have a very strong operations team. Yeah. We have a very strong HR team and we have great team leaders and we have great culture going on. Mm. So, to take your people out of that then and move them into your own, like they're already in an office. So to move them all to work from home um, and to be their own siloed thing, I just think business owners are too busy by the time they get to that point. And when it's humming well, usually what starts to happen is they're coming to us and saying, hey, what I'd like now is my own person to manage my team mm, on the nice. floor. Cool. We, you know, so we've had those. And, and you know, if a team got big enough, we would siphon off a room and actually put yeah. their own branding if they, if they wanted to. Uh, we haven't done that yet. But, yeah. um, so I, th I think um, I think working from home, look, I, I'm, not, I'm a fan of it, obviously. I do it myself, although I have mm. kids now and I'm strongly thinking I need to change tack. <laughs> I think I'd like to get out of home. <laughs> so, yeah. It's almost impossible. Um, so, but to do, to do work from home with large teams, like, I know you do it and you've got 35 or so staff. I think I did it up to about 60 VAs. And at around yeah. 50, it's to, to kind of implode for me personally. I wasn't yeah. really able to do it. And I think for some business owners, it could implode at five or six. And mm -hmm. I think they, some people just don't want the hassle of it. Others like the professionalism of the environment and the computer systems and all that sort of stuff. So Look, I have those days. Every probably one week out of four each month, I have one of those blow ups where I go, right, we're getting an office. <laughs> <laughs> and uh so it's yeah challenging. It's, it's challenging, challenging. yeah even with yeah. great people like i still Absolutely. have some people that at home and i would say that it's still challenging uh, mm. and you know when we were looking at growing and, and moving everyone home even some of my original people who are in manila now their their work from home there's a few of them left and even they said to me don't do it barb don't do it it's like a slippery slope you know because yeah. we all have to manage it then yeah uh, now we were yeah. Do it with the virus, but uh, and it's working okay. But yeah, it's it's not as easy as people think. Awesome. I don't I don't think there's a perfect answer there um, because yeah. you know we've had both. We've worked with so many businesses that have both, and I think it's just a it's a kind of jury's out kind of thing. Um, yeah. So we've got a question here from Neil um, asking Barbara, do you manage team from Australia or Philippines? Uh, so where do you prefer to manage from? <sighs> Say that again. Where do I? Well, I mean, where, I live where, in France. Where are you managing? Yeah. Manage so, so, so Barbara's just moved to France, Neil. Uh, so she's managing from there. So, interesting. Twenty-four hour operation. How do you go managing that? Uh, you know, because my fear. We're in the process of expanding our hours, and eventually we'll go to twenty-four hours yeah. as well. My fear is that 
uh, I'll either need to work 24 hours or that I'll have to have management team run off their feet 24 hours. Like, how does that work as a CEO? How do you make sure you manage your time? Yeah, yeah. so when I was in Australia, uh, actually, it's, it's almost easier from here because in the middle, I cut across all the teams, right? So mm. for me, this has been interesting because I've got my night shift te team leads and, and my day shift team leads and I catch the end of the Aussie day in the morning here and then yep. the night shift people come in so I can cut across them all. Cool. But having said that, I lead from afar. I have run, so although I have everyone in an office, I have built a, a company remotely because mm. I'm remote. Mm. And I know the, it's all down to the systems that you have. It doesn't matter where you are. Yep. Because I can get up any morning and we are massive Asana users. Mm. I to Asana, we're a big client of theirs. And within about 15 minutes in the morning, I can get a full picture of every single department across the entire business and I know everything that's going on, right? So yeah. um, that's a, I, I'm a bit of a systems junkie, to be totally honest. We have mm. huge mm. automation going on. We're a big Entreport user. We've got Asana. We, we're obviously a big G Suite user. Mm. Um, and I'm a firm believer that you don't need, like I don't do any of the doing, but I, I lead the entire team. So I know yeah. who's reporting to who and and what's going on. And I've managed to set it up that way. Asana is the motherboard for us and everyone knows that. We don't use Slack, we use a bit mm. of Skype. Well, yep. you probably should use chat and use speak, but anyway. Um, and it's Asana free. is where it all, yeah, mm. Asana is where it all happens. Do you know yeah. what I mean? So, cool. um, What are your favorite features so, in yeah. Asana? What do, you make, what do you make use of it? Is it like the, the portfolios view? Uh, is it like checking up on the inbox? Do you have a, a number of repeated tasks that you do every week uh, to check in on things? What's yeah. your kind of process so, there? Asana has been a bit of an evolution for us as well in that we started mm. off like I'm, I'm a big fan of keeping things very simple. I just, yep. you know, I love systems, but I can't stand complex systems. I just like systems that are, you know, very easy, four-year-old can get it. <laughs> yep. So in Asana, we started out with kind of recurring task lists and project lists and all of a sudden it became Frankenstein. You know, I mean, mm. it can become Frankenstein in there. Um, and these days, how, how we run it as a team is we run pipelines. So our projects list are all pipelines. So for example, mm. we would have, uh, we would have um, client leads, uh, client calls, then you know client pipelines, so the ones mm. that have signed up. And we move, we're constantly moving people through, like in the client pipeline, mm. we have someone who's signed up, then someone who's coming to interview, then somebody who's going through to onboarding, and we move them up and down our pipelines in Asana. And we have daily huddles where we do that together. So the yep. huddle is kind of something we try and do in the middle that cuts across as many teams as possible. Yep. Um, and keeping it simple and having rules in your business around how everyone uses Asana is key because mm. you all yeah. have to be on the same page. If one yep. person likes the board view and someone else likes the list view, that's not going to work, right? So yep. you kind of have to set the... You've got to set the tone, the pace, set the, the the system, and then everybody has to kind of plug into the system. Otherwise, it won't work. And then you, you're going to have solid systems documented. And I'm a big fan of this. Solid systems documented on like, okay, in this task, when it's on this board at this stage, this is what needs to happen. And then it's boom, 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 following that. Yeah, yeah. I, I'd like to awesome. think we're better at that. We're, we're, we're big fans of that, but we're not very good at it. Okay, <laughs> okay, so. cool. We're okay at it. As long, but, look, but we update our processes a bit more often than we do yeah as long as you as know. long as people are like doing the thing they're supposed to be doing like i think that's the most important thing um and then if you have enough to teach someone new how to do it uh what we've found is we've started transitioning to using google classroom uh which is part of g suite which is right. like a structured learning platform it's a little bit like a you can do it with a wordpress member site or any kind of lms learning management system um and that allows you to and our team built this out now which is amazing they just say okay here's all the things that this person needs to know if they're going into this area of the business and anytime we teach something new it's recorded and boom it goes straight in there um and so when That's someone comes brilliant. on it's like all right you're starting with support or you're starting with projects you're going to go into that classroom and you're going to learn how to do all the things in there and then it's tick, i'm going to steal that idea Thank you. I'm Please taking do. that one and I'm going to start implementing that. Please do. Yeah, well, it's, <laughs> yeah. it's classroom.google.com. And the, one of the best features is you can set uh, quizzes. So it's designed for uh, schools. And uh, so you can have quizzes and assignments. And the assignment might be watch this video and then they have to hand it in. And then they have to get a passing mark on the quiz. And if they don't pass the quiz, it's like, okay, we'll go back and redo the coursework, which is all the videos that you shared. Uh, so our team... Uh, the great thing is the team members, not just the managers, have been creating the content because they want to make sure that anyone who's working with them has a basic level of competency before they mm -hmm. uh, allow them to join their team, which is uh, which is pretty cool. Um, 
We've got some yeah. cool questions coming through. Okay, we've got a big question here. I'm going to try and summarize. Okay, recently launched our company in the Philippines, transitioned our existing team for, uh, from seat leasing uh, through BPO for six years, started growing our team, but had, uh, found it hard to recruit a recruitment agency because no one got back to our inquiries. Uh, so we ended up getting our own recruitment manager uh, all going well. What tips do you have for procuring services in the Philippines? Um, so an Australian business procuring services in the Philippines. Uh, yeah, what's it been like? I'm curious with that too. What's it been like you doing business? I don't, I'm not sure how much time you've spent in the Philippines, whether you've done you know, months at a time or, or longer or less. Um, but no, what about doing business locally? How's that been for you? Look, uh, I don't use a lot of suppliers. Again, I like to keep mm. things pretty simple. I mean, cool. we've got a great account. Yeah, like, yep. you know, don't overcomplicate it. I was going to say, like, mm. you know, maybe don't use an agency. Hire your own recruiter. Like, mm. if you're that big and you're going for it, then I'd probably bring on your own recruiter because I think that's probably going to be more cost effective than an agency. Mm. We tried to use some agencies. They didn't get back to us either. And <laughs> when they did, they were not cost effective at all. So, yeah. and I didn't think they really understood what it was we were deeply looking for. So we mm. built our own um, recruitment, recruitment uh, you know, I have my own HR team. I've sort of built my own stuff. Mm. The suppliers are using, you know, we obviously have our office guys that help us to build out our office. They've been great, uh, mm. but I don't tend to use any uh, mm. services. But the ones I have, I've been lucky, though, because the guys that I use uh, that help set up our structuring, I got introduced to those by a guy in Australia, and they've been fantastic. Um, awesome. They're in Manila. They also do accounting. Um yep. Not great on the accounting side, but I have. I, then the accountants I got were a referral from someone I knew anyway in Manila, and they mm. worked out well. So, awesome. yeah, I don't have a lot of advice on that because I've, I've I haven't had many challenges. Yeah, way. no, I, I think that's I think that's advice enough. Like I've found as well mm. Uh, mm. a number of times for us that that uh, building it internally was was the solution, uh, and I guess like yeah. I'm a control freak, <laughs> and so we all are. We yeah. all are. <laughs> We're all insurance. We all are. Uh, yeah. So you know, doing it, you know, my way, it was kind of like, all right. I'd, and and then once you've, uh, in my case at least, I found once I was exposed to the the you know the labor market and the efficiency of the cost, it was like any time we considered working with an Australian firm for advertising or for uh, you know legals or for any kind of consulting, it's like, whoa, holy crap! Like that's you know just so it's many dollars. It's yeah, it's it's challenging. Um, so, why did you choose Hong Kong over you know Singapore or I don't know one of the other countries, the Seychelles or Virgin Islands or something else? Um, well, you know, I don't think again there's a particularly detailed answer to that. I just I had some, okay. I started off with the wrong advisors and blew up a load of money, you know, sort of trying the wrong structuring, and then I was introduced to happy to share Ethos. Ethos mm -hmm. Hong Kong is the correct I use, run by an Australian guy. Mm -hmm. They are happy to introduce them to anyone um, and they were great for me. I mean, they just mm. sort of held my hand through the whole process and the Hong Kong Filipino uh, structuring is, I think, well, it's the one most of them are using. It's mm. the best sort of tax structuring that you can get. Yep. Uh, I, didn't, I didn't explore Singapore. I think it might've been easier to do, to get banking and everything maybe set up in Hong Kong. Mm. And I didn't really, uh, once I kind of saw that solution, I was pretty happy with that, and I didn't really look too too deeply into the other areas. Yeah, and have you been concerned like with what's going on in Hong Kong no. over the last year or so? <laughs> no, it doesn't really bother you. Not yeah. really. I mean, you know, I think you know Hong Kong has been a business hub for you know a very long time. Mm. Uh, am I going to eat my hat with that? Maybe, but I, I don't think in the short term it's it's uh it's a it's an issue you know yeah i don't have an opinion one way or another i'm, I'm just kind of going through the same journey and, and curious yeah um you know you know whether people had had been actually worried about it so i've got a personal question for you You don't have to answer this one but like um where do you plan on accumulating assets uh for your wealth building uh, you know you spent time in australia you've got the incorporation in hong kong you've got links to the philippines but i know you can't really like you could buy condos there but not land and now you're in france like where do you plan on stashing the uh <laughs> Is it like gold bars in a Swiss bank account somewhere or is it all in cash under your bed? Like, Where do you plan on <laughs> domiciling your wealth? Yeah, that's a very good question. And it's something at the moment, funnily enough, I'm trying to find, I actually have an advisor over here in Europe that I'm yep. now working with because I, I have this Hong Kong thing. I also have a trust in Australia. I have a company mm. there. I've got stuff everywhere. 
And that's fine at the moment. But if I'm planning, I don't know what we're doing with this Europe thing. But if you mm. eventually you start thinking about, well, how do you mold all this together? So this, mm. the, the, I don't have an answer for it. Um, at the moment, it's kind of in lots of different places. And to be quite honest, I'm not sure how much wealth is there right now anyway. Mm. So, mm. But what I would say is the power, if I've learned anything, the one thing I spend money on, Western advisors in legal, tax and accounting. Hmm. I would just strongly urge, I've made this mistake myself, where you try and think about yourself or you try and get, you know, a cheap solution. Good advisors cost money and they're worth hmm. they're worth the money, right? So yeah. Yeah. find the right advisors and I now have to find somebody that can cope with a global tax structuring situation like that. So there's no point in finding a local Aussie who can deal with the Australian thing and doesn't really know what's going to happen in France or, you know, there's a lot of implications living in France or Europe right now. Yeah. And you don't want to go to KPMG so, and drop 200 grand a year no, on advisory. No. You're just sort of in this weird middle bit. <laughs> yeah, and, yeah. Right. and it's probably about talking to a lot of people and getting like finding people in your network that maybe know others that have used, you, you know, it's very difficult, but it's worth spending time finding the right advisors. Yeah, mm, totally. That's my only answer on that really is just to take the time with those decisions. Don't rush into anything. <sighs> yeah, it's been a journey for us. Um, and, uh, and yeah, Appreciate the uh, appreciate the sentiments. Um, if you're comfortable with it, you don't have to share it right now. But if you're comfortable with sending me the links to some of those advisors that you recommend, I can put those in the oh, show yeah. notes. Um, yeah. yeah, no, no problem. I can share those. Cool. Yeah. yeah, we have Nadi who said he would love a referral, and Chris uh, has asked how many staff uh, do you have in the Philippines? Uh, Chris, I can answer that one. Barbara has 140. 140 is that right now? Yeah, it's about 125 now. 125. Had to share a couple. Okay, had to <laughs> yeah. had to move a couple. Um, yeah. So where do you see uh, where do you see the the future going? Uh, you know we've we've got a, a question mark on the next um, three to six months yeah. for Australian businesses. Uh, what advice do you have? Where do you where do you see things going? And what would you like to share to the business community about you know what you think they can expect or what they should be doing? Yeah. So a couple of things. Um, just to give a little bit of insight into my background before I mm. did this, I spent um, fifteen years in investment banking. Mm. I was ten years as an equity trader in the financial markets, so I'm well adept at pivoting on a daily basis and dealing with the volatility of all of that sort of thing. Mm. Um, I got involved in a in a in a uh, management buyout of a business. I did sweat equity. I had no money at the time in two thousand and eight. Mm. Yep. Um, been through a couple of these massive like big financial crisis because this isn't a health crisis right this is a financial crisis oh yeah the health crisis just the trigger um and in 0809 i i came out i mean i was laid off from deutsche bank like everybody else we were losing jobs um and i got an opportunity to kind of jump on the coattails to be honest of so of a, of a group of people mm. that were were taking a business out of deutsche bank right mm. and it, it was an asset management business and it's 10 years in now and I'm sure it's going through pain at the moment. But, you know, that, that grew to sort of five, six billion of funds under management over the 10 wow. year period. But, and I'm still involved in that company. I'm just not an employee there anymore. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I have, first of all, I have a lot of experience of dealing with um, volatility hmm. uh, and uncertainty in markets. Um, and I also have a strong track record of taking on risk when there's blood on the streets. So... <laughs> Yep. Kind of know what I'm talking about. Now, it doesn't mean that you're going to get every crisis right. But what I would say to people out there, the difference, I know everyone's saying, oh, my God, this is worse than 08. The mm -hmm. first thing I would say about that is don't forget how bad 08 was. Mm -hmm. We had a banking, the banking system collapsed pretty yeah. much. You know, yeah. Right. You had queues of people outside banks trying to take their money out. Right. So let's not forget how just how bad 08 actually was from a global um, markets perspective and from a business perspective mm. the difference in this crisis we are we are facing into something that is quite dramatic um, but in 08 remember how long it took for governments to agree to drop money from the sky right basically and to allow the fed and the, and the central banks to buy back assets and to actually drop money out of the sky mm. it has taken all of about five seconds flat for the governments to come out and drop money from the sky oh in this crisis. yeah yeah it's been yeah. it's been impressive that, like and it it's kind of feels good. like they're making up the you know building a plan as they jump off the cliff and it's like it's it's good a little yeah. you know a little concerning but it's good <laughs> yeah now i'm not yeah. saying you know who knows what what implications are those going to have mm. in the future for inflation and all these things that we don't yeah. know yet but right now it took about 12 months for that to happen during the gfc right mm. it's taken about 12 minutes in this environment so the likelihood is that 
we will actually muddle through this because people are getting money into the, people are there's support in the economies in America it's happening in Europe mm. so businesses will kind of be propped up right now mm. whether that's a good thing or a bad thing in the short term lots of businesses will muddle through yep. but from a business perspective what you now need to be thinking about is of the ones that are muddling through who are the winners because yeah. this is now going to turn into a race and mm. it's very insensitive to talk about it in this you know what we're in right now is this crisis and everyone's being sensitive to each other but the reality is there will be massive winners and there will be massive losers we're now mm. in creative destruction mm. you know the, the markets after this will be fundamentally different from what they were before and it's about spending the next three four months just watching what's you know which businesses are going to rise in this because online digital you know e-commerce all of these things will boom right yeah. so don't think that it's all bad but there will be winners and losers and it's about keeping your eyes open and watching how the money falls and and who makes the best use of the money put it that way mm, love it that's my theory this warren buffett quote comes to mind uh you know be scared when everyone's greedy be greedy when everyone's scared uh yeah. and uh yet. Yeah. i don't think there's blood <laughs> on the streets yet that's what no. i'm saying people you buy now i'm like i wouldn't but yeah you know over the next three to four months you'll start to see a lot of uh the, the businesses that are trying to muddle through, but the mindset of the owner is not strong enough to even the money won't help. You mm -hmm. know, it'll just, they'll sort of falter. And the people who have the strongest mindset and the real entrepreneurial animal spirits will come out with their pivots and they'll come out stronger out of this whole thing. Yeah, I and certainly know that um, it's, it's, it's been, you know, for us, it was, uh, you know, we're a fairly resilient business. We're selling email. Not many people are switching off their emails. Uh, but <laughs> But it was proof. enough. Yeah, well, yeah, that, that bit's pretty good. But we do sell consulting as well, right? Um, and that's a big part. That's a big profit center for us. Uh, and uh, people start to cut consulting. And uh, what we saw in the first few weeks was enough for us to go, oh, you know, we've got to be careful here uh, and make sure that we've actually got a real solid plan uh, for it. Um, like you, I believe there will be winners and losers. A uh, quote that I saw from someone was to... Um, promote your promote your dead wood of your staff to your competitors <laughs> and oh, <no>. uh, <laughs> that was brett brett kelly <laughs> uh and you know what i what i think is there is certainly uh yeah creative destru destruction as you say it's it's shifting it's adjusting uh and i see i mean i'm mostly interested in the australian market 95 percent of our customers are australian based currently uh mm -hmm. and what I've thought for a number of years is from spending a lot of time in the Philippines and, you know, kind of fluttering around the rest of Asia as well. Um, I found or uh, well, discovered how far behind we are in online and social business. Um, yeah. You know, I went to a glazier to uh, buy some mirrors for a shop fit out uh, in Davao in the Philippines. And it was, you know, just imagine an industrial unit shit everywhere. And uh, we walked in and we're trying to get a quote from them. And there's no signage, there's no phone number, there's no, you know, quotes or anything else. It's just a shop with glass and shit everywhere. And uh, they said, we'll send your dimensions to our Facebook business page. And I went, what? So they have no infrastructure, no phone or anything else. They're just shitty, sitting, yeah. in a, sitting in a shed. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and they said, hey, just message us on the business page. And businesses are instant in getting back to you on Facebook. And I thought, you know what, if I came home, and I wanted to book my car in for a safety check with my mechanic, there's no way his reply to my Facebook message. Forget it. You've got to pick up the phone and, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's just not the way the business is done here. Uh, another example is that I was in, um, in China up in the mountains and no phone signal, middle of absolute nowhere. Um, but in order to pay, instead of paying with cash, there was actually a barcode for uh, WePay or Alipay or whatever it was. Uh, and yeah. so you would just pay, and this was a, this was a, a bamboo hut, a bamboo hut that we were in, and they had no electricity, no wow. internet, but they had a barcode to pay for your meal. And uh, you know, I saw those examples, and I just thought, wow, we've got so far to go ourselves. And I think this is a kick up the ass for Australian businesses. Thankfully, people are getting online, and they're using Zoom, and they're doing their online sessions, and people are getting a bit more serious about e-commerce. Uh, but it's like, guys, hello, this is this has been coming for like five years that, you know, digital transformation, um, at least, at, at least there's some hustle from everyone, which is great. There's enough, there's enough fear that the, that the hustle's coming out. Um, and, uh, you know, I guess we'll see. 
your consulting might drop initially because everyone, mm. you know, they're going to cut. Yeah, they, they'll cut, right? But then the money comes in and then, you know, some of those clients, you need to ask yourself whether those are really clients for you now anyway, based yes. on where they've been. They may have been, but, you know, maybe there's a, you just got to think, you don't want to save every client because maybe they're not all for you in the future anyway. Yeah. Um, and it's okay to kind of go, well, we're in this kind of shifting landscape but for what it is you're doing and what you're consulting on is there going to be a market for that 100 percent? there is like mm, mm. the company turning around and realizing this in a few months time and going jesus we were completely si like we got blindsided by this mm, we mm. need to make sure that we never get blindsided by this again who do we go to and i mean that's where you know so you mightn't see it straight away but in time when they muddle through people will come back in and then the transformation will come will happen yeah i I'm very Oh, no, I, I appreciate that. And I'm, I'm very comfortable that, um, and what we've discovered is we've always had in the back of our minds that we enable remote work. That's that's always been a really big one for us. We've never messaged it that way um, because baby boomer business owners don't want to strap on a backpack and travel around the world as a, as a vagabond, right? Uh, but now everyone's forced to. So it's like, okay, we can go hard with that messaging now. Um, you know, how will businesses consume our services in the next 12 months that's still for us to uh, uh you know for us to work on uh, but at the end of the day we're about businesses leveraging technology to be efficient grow and scale their teams and and have things work so i feel i feel pretty good with that um i think one of the most important pieces of that puzzle is obviously the staffing and the team uh, which is where you come in um and so i see this like symbiotic relationship with technology and people technology and people and and you know Absolutely, leadership and yeah. management and um, my philosophy on technology is if you get it simple and you get it right, then you can just do business. You don't spend your day fighting technology. You don't spend your day trying to connect this to that and get Zapier talking to this no. and, you know, get all these things. Like if you get the tech sorted, then you can just focus on being a leader, on company strategy, on the financial markets, on, you know, gobbling up your competitors or whatever the next 12 months is going to look like for you. Uh, and so if I can say to anyone, just like, the tech is not the answer, uh, and you know it's it's the people in your team and your strategy. That's that's business. Tech is just a tool. Well, remember that the word remote, and this could be something you could go out and talk about. Hmm. The word remote doesn't necessarily mean working from home because no, I think that we might see a mini boom next year. Maybe not straight yeah. away, but co-working spaces are getting killed right now. Yeah. But eventually, as people say, like in my local hometown where I was born in Ireland. A lot of people commute to Dublin, and it's kind of an excruciating commute to Dublin and back. And I was thinking, well, people are not going to go back to that, right? They're not going to agree to go back to that. But are they going to all work from home? Probably not either, because there's kids and there's, you know, it's kind of awkward working from home unless you're set up properly, especially yeah. if you have children. So I think there will be a new boom in little co-working spaces in these places where people want to have you know they want to work for the big corporate but they 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 want to work in a in a in a professional environment because home is not for everyone and that's still yeah. remote you know yeah. yeah um so so yeah remote can mean everyone thinks remote means nomadic backpack on working from home working from cafes it doesn't necessarily it's a much bigger word than that it just means like working online from different locations and those locations could be offices in different cities yeah you know I I'm hoping that is the case. There's a concept called work hubs, which I heard about a couple of years ago, which was exactly that. Uh, Co-working spaces, but you're working for a corporate or you're working for a big company. Yeah. The most compelling argument for that is the co-workers that you spend time with socially are not your boss or your subordinates, right? So like you yeah. go out for Friday night drinks with your actual team and it's like, oh, I don't want to drink too much or say this thing because that person's there. You can't lay off steam and say, oh, you know, the boss is being a dickhead today. Yeah. Um, but if you're going out with someone who is not in the same company as yours, you have that genuine social interaction, uh, vulnerability with each other, friendship, companionship, care for each other, and, uh, you know, a great place to, to work and bounce ideas off each other without that context of, oh, this is my boss and they might think differently in my performance Absolutely. review if I'm really raw with yeah. them here. So I think that I think we'll see a boon in that, but not for 12 months. Like, I think that'll take time, maybe six months. But I think next year you'll start to see people go, well, I tried working from home. Then I went back to work and it didn't work. And then I tried at home again. And then all of a sudden this whole thing, you know, some people will even out and, and say they want to do something else. So. Yeah, I think it's the future. I don't know 
you know, I, I think sometimes I'm, I'm, you know, I have a rosy, optimistic view of what the future will look like, uh, and yeah. uh, I'm very curious to see how much of that will actually uh, become a reality. I think we have to be optimistic. I mean, I, I wake up every morning and I'm like, give, just give me a coffee because I'm going down that rabbit hole of, <laughs> and then I just think, you know, as an entrepreneur, you have to, you know, look, we, we talk about the frontliners in the medical field, right? At the moment, the frontliners are being applauded and of course they are, they're doing, I mean, it's incredible the work that they're doing. But who do you think the frontliners are going to be when the, when the virus is gone? Like, yeah. It's going yeah. to entrepreneurs it's going to be the people who are driving the economy and mm. they're going to become the frontliners they're all of us yep. so we need to kind of realize that we're the next ones that are going to have to step up mm. and i think mm. that's a powerful message that i personally am starting to go out with to say you've got a responsibility yep. like i was struggling with the idea of selling offshore staff and i actually had a conversation with a with a group of mentors last night about this and i was saying i'm finding myself holding back on marketing because it feels insensitive to say, mm -hmm. hey, you know, hiring the Philippines is cheaper mm -hmm. when people in our own countries are being laid off, right? Mm -hmm. And then they would be, but hold on a sec, what's the alternative? Companies mm -hmm. collapse. Like mm -hmm. you have a responsibility to go out and tell people that this is a strategy that might save their company. And I thought, yep. actually, yes, you know, <laughs> the same yep. with your thing of the systems and, and the cloud-based stuff and the consulting. That's yep. the way to think about it for anyone else out there. More staff like equals more sales equals more GST equals, yes, you may down the line hire more Australian staff. I'm paying yeah. a general manager an extreme salary in Australia. Uh, and I would not have been yeah. able to do that without growing yeah. the business over the last five years because we, you know, we went from the Australian staff to the full Philippine staff. Um, and then as we've grown the business, it was, and it was not a matter of executive needing more executive support. We acquired his business yeah. and he is able to take care of a particular division. Oh, yeah. But the, rea yeah. the reality yeah. is, uh, the reality is that we're, you know, we're paying someone here in PYG and, and everything else that uh, that comes with it as well. I don't actually at this point, at the moment, I don't have Western staff. I've had mm. a few salespeople and at the moment. I've taken back over sales myself because we're mm. in this kind of crisis. But I, I can't wait to hire a big Western mm. like position. But mm. I, I, I want somebody to support me in the role that I play. And I'm, we're, yeah. we're not there yet. We. We won't be now for a while, but you know, I will hire somebody. It could be US based, Europe based, or Australia based in time. It could mm. be you know, big sales roles and st st strategic roles that I'd like to happen outside of the Philippines. So, yeah. yeah. So, let's talk about how can, uh, how can people get help with you? What's the first step in someone chatting to you getting started? Sure. So if you go to our website, first of all, there's a ton of resources on our website, but not that you need yeah. any more, you know, overwhelming stuff. But yep. if you're at a stage where you, um, you know, you want to just find out more about how you can work successfully with a VA, there's a webinar on our website by me. Mm -hmm. So you go to the virtual hub, the virtual hub .com, um, and you can also book a call uh, on that website. And at the moment, you'll get to speak to me, which you don't normally, but uh, I can actually help awesome. you on the call to figure out whether we're a good fit for you and whether you're good fit for us yeah and what kinds of businesses uh, who's the customer you, you most commonly help yeah sure so the one we have such many diverse businesses so we don't mm. have one kind of business avatar but the mm. one thing that ties all of the businesses together is they all have a fairly developed online strategy so mm. it, you could be anything from like uh we you know a dentist through to you know a facebook ad agency through to um you know, a yoga instructor, like we've got lots of different types of businesses, but they're all doing online stuff. So they're doing webinars, they've got funnels running, they might be using systems like Entreport, HubSpot, uh, Infusionsoft, Active Campaign, and you're building campaigns, you're doing social media, blogging, you've got a fairly, you know, content rich website. Those are the kinds of things that our VAs are all trained on in helping in those types of businesses. So nice and yeah. so important right now. People like yeah. should not be cutting back on the marketing. Like you should be going no. gung ho on that, being visible at a minimum. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. I've increased my marketing team just to give you a tip. My everyone's everyone's in marketing now. I'm like you're all in marketing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we've got a couple of good questions that have just come through. Chris has asked. Uh, he, Chris Finn. He said he's just signed up to uh, Virtual Hub, which is awesome. Um, do you utilize HMS Hubbard Hubbard management systems? That's a good question. Say that one again. What is it? HMS? Do, do, uh, Hubbard Management Systems, the, the Scientology uh, Business Management Systems. No, I haven't no. even heard of that. Is that oh, what we should be doing? 
I oh I have I have I'm way I'm way into it. Uh, so um, right. it's uh, this this might be one for another uh, for another episode. But yeah, there um, we are, we're about that's... to launch Shopify. We're getting into Shopify. That's the only <laughs> one I'm putting on right now. Scientology's later. <laughs> uh, cool. It's a um, it's a it's a business and management framework, not necessarily Scientology itself, but it was it was written by L. Ron Hubbard, and it was on yeah. on how they organize the. The organization. I'm not a Scientologist. I'm non-religion, non-religious, but non, no, non -religious, yeah. but, but um, yeah. I studied the the management system for a few years. It's very interesting. Okay, Anton has asked, "Hey, hey, Barbara, do you hire VAs for business divisions, or is it focused on supply in one division? Uh, for example, uh, do you hire for entreport experts or Asana experts, or is it uh, more broadly like a, a functional role that you hire for?" No. So we don't. First of all, I'll give you a tip. You can't really hire an entreport expert. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. We have to manufacture our own, to be totally honest. You can get people <laughs> yeah. to say to them, we actually manufacture them, which takes months to train them. But mm. so all of our VAs, we they there's they're generalist VAs, but we um, have three levels of VA. And level one is more like admin based, level two handles all that social media, blog content formatting, that kind of thing. Our level three VAs, they're only that level because we have to train them so deeply and they're in mm. those platforms, but they still do all the other stuff. So it's just like they, they do the whole gamut of everything, but they're more technically savvy yep. and they're better able to come up with those kinds of things. I'm not sure if that answers the question, but I think don't it does. Hire, for example, I wouldn't hire a bookkeeper for you. Yeah. Right. You know, I would we don't hire like that. We, we do this type of VA. Uh, mm. And that's that's it. We don't say, I'm not going to go out and find you a content writer. We don't yep. do specific groups like that. Yeah. Okay. Cool. So, sounds like um, a slant towards marketing functions, uh, yeah. Yeah. but starting with like you know the ba the basic competencies of getting content out there, making sure it works on the website, and then moving up in in competency and more specialized services of the entreport and the uh, the stuff, which yeah. which is what someone should do anyway. Like if you don't have your basic blogs and stuff sorted out, there's no point going crazy in entreport because you've got to get the basics yeah. of your content marketing stuff done first. Yeah, yeah, Sweet. absolutely. Yes, yeah. so that's we like to do that kind of business, but we will do VAs. I mean, we do you do you know we we have VAs working in financial advice businesses and stuff like that as well that are doing more calendar management and they're doing more admin stuff but they're very good at that so that's okay mm -hmm. too but we prefer to stick within our lane because we are we are in that niche of digital marketing implementation it's what we like to do because that's what we cool. all love we all love yeah. awesome that is uh it's very clear and very good to know i'm going to sign off now i want to say thank you so much for the conversation uh this has been really enjoyable for me and uh and i appreciate your time sharing with everyone thank you so much thank you for having me it's been a been a joy thanks thanks everyone Awesome. Thank you. I'm going to uh, go ahead and do my sign off now. Uh, so thank you very much for joining us, guys. Uh, it's been great to have you here and I appreciate uh, spending the time with you. Uh, very much appreciate you uh, taking the time to listen to Barbara as well. If you're interested in checking out what Barbara does, head along to thevirtualhub.com. Uh, and as she said, if you put in an inquiry there, you're actually going to connect with her personally, which is uh, pretty awesome, pretty lucky for you, someone who has the business acumen and experience that Barbara has uh, to be able to chat about your business even for a short period of time. Uh, so if you're interested in more about what we're doing, uh, head along to itgenius.com. Below this post, there are two links. Uh, one is to the Remote uh, Revolution group. That's all about running and scaling remote teams. Uh, the other group is G Suite. So if you're already on G Suite, check out the G Suite community. Uh, and of course, if you need any help from our team, head along to itgenius.com forward slash chat. Just pop us a message on Messenger and our team will be happy to help you out. Uh, we will sign off now and we'll see you in the next one. Thanks for joining. Cheers.